Okay, so um, hello everyone, and um, welcome to uh, this is I think this is our third edition of um, I'm talking about um, education and working in Canada. Okay, um, my name is Solomon, and I'm not quite sure if um, my colleagues are around, but quickly before we start. Um, just for the benefit of those who are about to join, it would be very nice if you unmute yourself. I'm sorry if you mute yourself, but if you have a question, you can unmute yourself or uh, maybe type, but I'll, I'll prefer that we, we, we chat, okay? So um, I really like the chatting part. I don't want it to be like um, I'm the only one talking, okay? So please, if you have um, questions, feel free to interrupt me and then you can um, you can ask your questions, okay? And if you can't hear me or if there's a noise or anything, um, yeah, please feel free to let me know so that I can adjust um, the system as well, okay? Okay, so let's talk about Canada, right? So it's part of North America, that's, you know, the continent, so that's, um, there's nothing we can do about that. Now, it's one of the largest owned lands in the world and it has 10 main provinces, okay? So this is what I want you to take note of. This one here is a province. Now, when we talk about provinces, just like we have in Ghana, it's called the regions, right? So say we have 10 regions in Canada, and then they have others they call territories. So that's, you know, more of like smaller than uh, <coughs> a region, okay? Now, Ottawa is the capital of It's a meeting, it's a meeting, please. Okay, and then we have, 36 million people. It's a meeting, now. please, I beg you. Let me the main language is English and French. Yeah. Okay. This is another phone. Go to my mama. Go to my mama. So can you, can you meet yourself? Yeah. Okay. So we have two main languages, English and French. That's what we have here in Canada, right? So it means if you can speak English or French, you're in a good place, right? And... Yeah, that's really the basic information. Now, if you look at this chart that I have here, it talks about where the workforce is gonna be, right? In some, you know, 2022, that's a projection. And you can see that a lot of the things are be, gonna be coming from the professional scientific and technical services. That is where we are gonna be having these types of um, jobs. Okay, you can see all the other ones too here as well, right? So just wanted to give a projection for you to see how things are in terms of how things are gonna pan out in, 2020 projection. Okay. Now, why do you want to study in Canada? Well, there's so many universities in Canada and you know, all over the world. Now, the main advantage, okay, main advantage, this is all, all from my personal experience. The main advantage of studying in Canada is that after you finish with your school, let's say you go to school in UK, okay, or you go to school in, um, let's say, um, US, for example, when you are done, um, they don't give you a work permit to work. I think they give you one year work permit to work. And then after that, you need to find a company who is going to employ you, blah, 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 and all that. Or you just have to find somebody to, you know, um, you know get you papers and all that. It's difficult, right? Now, the main advantage is that in Canada, when you finish with your school, you have, let's say you did study for one and a half years and above. Okay, so let's say one and a half years to four years. When you finish with your school, you are given a three-year work permit, okay? A three-year work permit. And that three-year work permit, it allows you to stay in Canada and work full-time for four, three full years. And within that time, there are so many avenues that you can use to apply for permanent residency or what they call the green card in the US, okay? I'll be talking about it as well, okay? So um, the main thing is that if you really want to to relocate and you want to use school as the main thing, it's a good avenue, all right? Come to school here after your school, you work for three years. You don't have to work for three years, but uh, you can apply for permanent residency and then you get citizenship and all that. It's really one of the paths that Canada has. In fact, I would choose Canada over US because of this, all right? That I want to relocate from Ghana to Canada. And so I want a system that will help me or have pathways to help me to stay in Canada. And this is one of the best deals that when you finish with your school, if you schooled for at least a year and a half to four years, you're gonna have three years work permit, okay? Three years work permit. And with that, you can have so many avenues to apply for permanent residency or citizenship, like, you know, in, in Canada, okay? 
So that's one of the best parts. Now, beside that, there are so many things like affordable tuition, and then, you know, they have very good investors and, um, you know, other options to integrate you into Canada, okay? So those are my main preferences when it comes to studying in Canada, all right? Now, of course, we have, Canada has the same system as we have in Ghana, you know, just that maybe the years might be different, but we go to the same, like, um, what we call the JSS or this junior high school, senior high school, we do your bachelor's, your master's program, your PhD or professional degrees and all that. Those are things that is, you know, common to the Ghana um, system, okay? And my focus today on the education part would be on those who want to do a master's program or PhD or a certificate program, those kind of things. Yeah, I'll talk about that before we move on to the work permit and then the permanent residency, okay? All right, so these are some of the very good universities in Canada, so many of them. Now, in Canada, that's one thing I love about the Canadian system. There is not like one big university that has all the goodies, you know, and then all the other universities are just there. But here, it's every, every single university structure to favor the province that the university is in, all right? And they pump a lot of money in it, a lot of money, okay, so that people can actually watch, enjoy some of the um, things when they are studying. So it's really, really a good deal, all right? Now, if you want to con consider grad school, why do you want to do a master's program in the first place? Why? If somebody just said, oh, I want to relocate to Canada, so I want to do a master's program, that's fine. And somebody also said that, okay, I, I really want to get a better job from um, the one that I have right now, and so I want to study in Canada or that kind of thing. Well, if, you, if you're a continuous learner, or if you want to have experience on research, okay, it's actually a good deal for you to really um, get some education in, in Canada, right? Because Canada is really a lot of research. Whatever field you choose, nursing, um, engineering, uh, mathematics, whatever. Whatever field you choose, you're going to do a lot of research, okay? Especially when you come for a master's program or a PhD program. You're going to do a lot of research that is going to give you a lot of um, experiential um, um, learning, okay? So it's really good. If you want to go back to Ghana, wherever you want to stay, it's really a good deal when, when you have some of these things, okay? And then... You also have, um, one of the things you want to look at is whether you want to work in industry or academia. Okay, so some people want to stay in industry. Okay, now my, my personal advice, if you want to stay in industry, there's no need to get uh, a PhD um, degree or anything like that in Canada. It's very good to go for what we call the certification programs. Okay, certification programs. Now with the certification programs, it means that you really are going to get trained on specific um, in, in specific professions. And after that, you can actually apply for jobs. Now, industries in Canada are not looking for people who have PhDs or anything like that, no. There are very few industries that are looking for people with PhDs, all right? So if you want to really go into industry, then um, think about your master's or your PhD again, because it might not be a good path for you. But again, again, all the people who finish their master's program, if they are looking for industry, they also get a job in industry as well. So you cannot really rule it out, okay? Now, if you want to go into academia or research, if you really want to do um, stay in the field of research or academia, then of course, you don't have any path than to go through the master's and PhD programs and blah, 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 and all that, okay? So those ones, um, you don't really have an option. And then, it depends on your what, your professional goals. So sometimes when you have a master's program in some of the companies in Ghana, you're actually going to move up the rank because you have a master's program. So it could be a motivation why you want to do a master's and all that. Okay. Now, one of the things you have to watch out for is the location of the school. This is really, really important. Don't just pick any school and then you attend in Canada. You really have to look at the location of the school because the whole bunch of things that's actually linked to the location of the school, like jobs, like um, paths to get your green card or what we call the permanent residency. So when I say permanent residency, I mean the green card, okay? That's the, um, the Canadian version. So Canada calls it permanent residency, but um, US, they call it the green card. And so it's important that you look at some of these options when you are looking at what um, the location of the school. For example, if you want to become a permanent resident, it's really good to stay outside Ontario. Okay, so this is one of the regions. It's one of the regions in Canada, it's called Ontario. That's where I am right now, all right? And the reason is that Ontario has a lot of the jobs. In fact, you end up in Ontario anyways because all the big jobs and everything, they have it in this region, okay? However, 
if you come fresh from, let's say, Ghana, and you come to a place like Ontario, it's difficult for you to really get your permanent residency or your green card, unless you go through the federal level. And I'll explain that in a, in a second, okay? So one of the main things we have here is that we have two main um, things. One is the provincial government, okay? Provincial government. And then the other one is the federal government, okay? Now, think about it like we have in Ghana, we have like right now NPP is in power. So NPP is the main boss. And then um, um, Greater Accra region is also on its own. But here, Greater Accra region can make its own laws and everything and come up with their budget and everything on their own, like a full government does, all right? And then the big government, which is what like the NPP also make, makes um, their own things for the whole of Ghana, that kind of thing. So here, the federal government is the main boss and then the provincial government actually it's, it's, it's for the region, but they have a lot of power, not like we do have in Ghana. So the province can decide that, okay, this year, we are looking for foreign students to become permanent residents in this part of our region. And we want people who have experience in this field. They can decide that the, the federal government cannot do anything against that, all right? And so the location of the school that you want to attend will be a very good thing to look at when you are trying to what, get um, a permanent residency or what, um, your citizenship and all that, okay? And also you have to look at the scholarships, badges, stipends, and all these kind of things. And I'll, I'll be talking about that. Okay. Now, why do I talk about scholarships and badges and everything? If you attended a university or um, if you went to school in Ghana, all right, and then you have your bachelor's already, and you want to do, let's say, a master's or a PhD program, if you have a first class or a second class upper, trust me, you don't have to pay for your teaching fees when you come to Canada to school for a master's program or a PhD program. You don't have to, okay? And the way it works is that the government, so I'm a prof. One thing I do is that I look for money. Where do I get the money from? I do applications to government organizations. I do applications to companies, industries come to us that, okay, we have this problem, we want you to solve for us, okay? And so they give me money. Now, the money that they give me doesn't go to my pocket. Now, I use that money to pick a student from, let's say, KNUST and bring them over. Okay, come and do a master's program with me. And I give them that money. And then that money they used to pay their tuition fees and then they can use some for their accommodation and their food. Now, it's not gonna make you rich, but you're gonna be comfortable in terms of, you don't have to worry about tuition fees, you don't have to worry about accommodation, you don't have to worry about what food. I came to Canada with only $50 in my pocket, okay? And I got to Toronto Airport, I had $50 in my pocket. But again, I was on, on this scholarship thing. And so everything will be paid for. All right. Now, this is not really like a scholarship scholarship. We call that the research assistantship, All right, research mm -hmm. assistantship. And so with this research assistantship, the main thing is that you want to really know how can I get a research assistantship? Because I know a lot of the problems in Ghana is that when I want to go for a master's program, I don't have money to pay my tuition fees. So how can I get one? All right. The answer is that if you had a first class or if you had a second class upper, you shouldn't pay for your master's or your PhD, and I'll show you how. Now, if you have a second class lower, okay, there are things you can do to also get some of these stipends, and I'll show you how that is done. Okay. Any questions before I continue? Any questions? Any questions on this? Yeah. Yes. Um, so when you say if you have a first class or a second class, it does apply to all fields or all fields. There's, still, all fields. there's still have an advantage. No, all fields, all fields, social, social sciences, um, wh whatever field you did in Ghana, they do, they, in fact, master's program in Canada is all research based, okay? You are going to do research in the lab. People think that the research is really, really tough and all that, but it's really not that tough. Okay? It's not that tough. You can easily do it if if you went to school in Ghana, anybody can easily do that, okay? So it applies to all the fields. It doesn't matter whether if you did um, a mathematics or if you did social or human, uh, uh, how do you call that? The sociology and all that, it's all, it's all part of it. Okay, it's all part of it. Any other questions, please? Hello. Yes, please go ahead. I'd like to find out, what if you have second class lower division, mm -hmm. but then you have a master Yes. 
So you have a second class lower, but then you have a master. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's in fact that's really a good thing, all right. So if you have a second class lower and you've already gotten a master's, nobody's going to look at your bachelor's. They're just going to look at your master's transcript. Okay. So it's a good. In fact, it's one of the tricks you can use to um, easily get um, your 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 admission. Okay. But I'll I'll show you some other tricks as well as as we move along. Okay. Please, any other questions? Any other questions? All right, let's move on. Okay, so think about it. If you are, let's say, if you want to apply for a school in Canada, one of the first things that you have to start with is you, you cannot just, okay, this is this. You can't apply to the university directly, okay? All right, especially if you are coming to do a master's or a PhD program. And the reason is that 90% of the schools will ask you, who is your supervisor before you even apply for that mission, all right? Now I'll show you the variations, but this is about 90% of the applications in Canada. And the reason is that, as I told you, when I get the money, okay? If I go and apply for money from a company or from the government or whatever, that I'm going to do A or B research, okay? The main thing is that I want to be able to, um, the main thing is that I want to be able to kind of, I'm trying to mute this person, okay? Okay, done. All right, so the main thing is that I want to be able to get students to work on the project. I give them the money to work on the project. So if you are applying for admission, for example, this is really, um, it applies to engineering students, for example. It's like, it's, it's always like that. For engineering, you don't have a way out. If you did engineering in Ghana, for example, or if you want to come and do your master's in an engineering field or a PhD in an engineering field, you need to find a supervisor or a professor who is willing to supervise you, okay, for your PhD or your master's, okay? If you don't find one, you can't even apply to the school. Or if you can apply, but we are just going to throw your application away. And the reason is that you don't have a supervisor or you don't have a professor. Okay. So the first thing is that you need to have found a prof who is willing to take care of you for your master's or your PhD. And that prof is going to give you what we call the stipend. Okay. Now, this stipend is enough to pay your tuition fees. Is enough to pay your accommodation. Is enough to pay like your food for the whole time that you'll be here for your program. So masters is usually two years, and then PhD is usually four years. Okay, now I say usually because it depends. I, for example, my masters was two years, but I did it in one year. It, it doesn't mean that you have to stay for two years. No. So it depends on how you do your research and how the research actually works out for you. Else, you can stay for longer. I know people who have done more than two years right, for their master's. So it all depends on the research. But the first thing is that you need to have found a professor who is willing to supervise you for your program. Let's say you did nursing in Ghana. You want to come and do a master's program in nursing. Of course, it's the same thing. You need to find a supervisor who is willing to supervise you for your nursing. Because here, when you're doing a master's program, you're going to be doing a lot of research. And the research supervisor is the one who is going to be paying your tuition fees, is the one who's going to be um, paying your um, accommodation and food and everything. Okay. So, in fact, you get paid every month by the same prof. And so the question is how then can I find a prof who is willing to pick me up and then take my, um, so that I can apply for admission? That is the first challenge. Okay. In fact, that is why I have this, um, we have this webinar. All right. And then after that, you can prepare your application. Look, if you have a prof who says, yes, I'm going to pick you, regardless of whether you have a lower or upper or whatever, you will get admission to the school, whether they like it or not. Okay, so when I go to Ghana, like let's say I go to Ghana and I pick a student from KNUSD, whether the university likes it or not, they will give admission to the student because I want that student in my research group and I want them to be part of my group. So here, the professors actually have a big say in your, whether you are getting admission or not. It's not the school that really determines, you know, some, some basic things will have to be met. But once a prof says, I want you, that's it. They are coming for you. Okay. Please, any questions on this? Any questions? 
Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. My name is Victor. How did you have it? Hello, Victor. So, yeah, you know, you remember me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, I was wondering, but in that case, that means I, I need to write a letter to the professor mm -hmm. and convince him that I want to do some master's, uh, master's with um, the institution before I can even do the application. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. And about the and about the stipend, like you're talking about. So, you mean that the 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 professor is the one going to um, pay all these uh, tuition fees, everything on my behalf? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. For the visa application, if let's say you are coming from Ghana, mm -hmm. and then you have to apply to the embassy for the, the Canadian embassy to, to study your master's. How would you prove your financial, I mean, um, prowess? That, 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 that's a good question, Victor. So the main thing is that the prof is going to write a letter to you that, okay, I've picked Victor, he's going to be a master's program, and I'm giving him this amount of money for his school, okay? So there'll be a letter coming from the prof, there'll be a letter coming from the university, and you add that to your document to apply for a visa. That's just one, like, a scenario. Let's say... Uh, I've completed mechanical engineering at CNUS. Okay, so I want to do my master's uh, in, in mechanical engineering at the Toronto. So, how much is the prof, for example, going to put aside for me to come and study? Like, in, in terms how of does how, much money? how does the letter come? Yeah, like how do I write to the, the prof that uh, I want to come and study nice. with you? Because um, I'm asking this not for myself, but for the uh, yes. other people. And I, I realize you are recording it, so maybe in the future somebody yeah. would like to watch and understand. So yeah, so Europe, you got, that is, we have different. it as part of this slide, okay? I'm, I'm going to show you how that is done. Great, great. Yeah, great. I'll be showing okay. how that is done. Yeah. Uh, I, will, I will watch the, the rest okay. and see how it goes. Okay, any other questions, please? Okay, so let's Yeah, hello, Prof. Yes, please go ahead. Um, good evening. I would like to know um, if um, connecting with a professor, does it only apply to engineering students or, or other fields? Or other fields, sociology, nursing, medicine, wherever you come from. So far as you really want to do a master's program or a PhD program. Now, this is different from if you want to do a certification program, okay? But if you are coming in for a master's or a PhD, regardless of who you are, you need to find a prof. Now, that is 90% of the work. Now, the issue is that some departments don't have this scenario. So for example, mathematics department in some other schools, they don't have this scenario. And what they have is that the, every student applies to the department and then they set up a committee, they pick the top 20 students and then they give them the money. In this case, the money is not coming from the prof, it's coming, yeah, it's coming from the prof, but it's given to the department to distribute to students. You know what I mean? So those okay. ones, they about, you know, if you go to every university, one department decides to do that and that's it. But majority of the school, they always have to have what? You have to have a prof who is going to pay your tuition fees, who's going to take care of your research. And so you would have to really contact a prof before you apply to the school. Let's say you are from um, um, uh, sociology, right? It's the same thing. I know all the social sciences department, they do the same thing. You have to find a prof who is willing to sponsor you, and then the prof will actually give you all the things that you need to be able to apply. Let's move on. So we have, yeah. now, before you, you, you have to get a prof, I'll show you how you do that, okay? And then once you have a prof who says, yes, I'll pick you, then you can now go and look at the requirement for um, application for admission. Then you can now get your reference letters, your transcript, your resumes, blah, 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 blah. And then you send it to the school, you apply, and then you know you are done. Right. So that's that's how um it it, it, it actually works. Now let's let's move on so that we can finish with some of the things on how to. So do you need a supervisor? The first thing you have to check is that do you need a supervisor? And I'm saying that for 90% of all the cases is yes. Some few departments, few of them. Okay. I know, for example, if you go to the University of Manitoba, the, the statistics department they have the departmental system. They don't have the supervisor system. 
they will ask that you apply to the department and then the department will set a committee and select the top 20 students and give them the money so that they come. So in that case, if you are not among the top 20, you're out. That's how it works for some department. But 90% of the department in Canada here, you have to find a prof who is willing to sponsor you before you apply, okay? So how then do I identify potential supervisors? How can I find somebody? Okay, how can I find somebody? Now, the first thing is that you really have to make a good approach to the prof. And I'll show you how all these things are done, okay? So you just have to look, it's a matter of looking. There's, there's nothing that you have to look, all right? So- but, 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 but before you get there, how do we locate the university first? Okay, so uh, I'll show you. Uh -huh. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, we are seeing the Zoom right. 5.42 is here. Okay, so let's say if I go to, I'm at York University, so I'm gonna use York University, okay? So you go to York University. Um, Victor, what, what department are you, like what program are you from? Well, not for me, but actually I'm doing MBA already. But um, yeah, I want, I want for mostly for other people who are working. All right, so let's but say- I, I, want, I, wanted, I just wanted to know like, do they have to look university by university or do you have a one portal where you can find all universities in Canada? All the, you can find all the universities on Google just as simple as all universities in Canada, okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, you can find them in Canada. In, in fact, you can find them province by province. You have a list of all of them. Let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say. For okay. example, here in Finland, when you mm -hmm. go to tebiinfo.fi, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a portal where you find all universities that are offering, uh, I mean, all universities in Finland. So you can apply, you can see all the courses. Or let's say if you go to baad.de in Germany, you will find all the universities and University of Python. So I was wondering, okay. does Canada does Canada have that one portal where? No. You, oh, okay, okay. No, I, I I don't know of any portal where you have a list of all the universities and so people can know. You just mm -hmm. have to use Google to find them, right? If yes, there is, okay. I am not I'm not aware of any. Maybe there is, but I'm not aware of any. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one of the main things is that, uh, yeah, okay. So the main thing is that, for example, if, if, if um, you can search the university that you want, you can, in fact, restrict your search. This is just Google search, okay? Now, first question, if you can't look for a university, I don't think you are qualified to even apply for a master's or a PhD program, okay? So that's one of the main things. So let's say I'm from York, all right? So I'm a mechanical engineering prof. So first thing I'll do is that I'm from mechanical engineering KNUST. So I'll go type... Um, York University Mechanical Engineer, for example, all right? And now when you click on York University Mechanical Engineering, you can, you can actually go to the portal where they have these things. Like, you know, so this one here is for those who want to pursue undergrad uh, program. So I can click on program details and then I'll check that, but that's not what I want. I want the one for grad school, okay? So I can go back and type Mechanical Engineering Grad School or Graduate Studies, okay? Like that. And then one thing I can actually uh, do is that when you click on this portal, it shows you the mechanical engineering department, all right? Their main program website, okay? So you can check all the things that they have over there from the mechanical engineering department. So let's say I can go to um, programs, all right? And then I'll type something like, uh, let's say, graduate studies. And then they're gonna ask me what type of program. Let's say, uh, yeah, computer science. Let's go to computer science, for example. And so I can go to their website, which is, this is the website for computer science, all right? So for computer science alone, you can actually have their main website where you can find all the profs that are in the computer science um, department, okay? Now, all of them, when you go, they have the faculty directory. Every university in Canada has that, every single one of them. So these are some of the profs um, um, in, uh, let's see, let me go pick one, mechanical. If I go to mechanical, I'll just filter it out. So please, you have to know how to, so these are some of the profs in mechanical, all of them, all right? Now, one thing I want to show you, when you click on the name of the prof, something prof is going to come. You. Can you come again? We saw you there. Oh yeah. If you click on the name of the prof, right, you're going to see something like this. And now they have their own website, okay? So when you click on this prof's website, you can see the things that she's doing at York, the people that she's working with, and all the things about the prof, okay? In fact, you can find 
a phone number, a email address, every single thing about the prof. Okay, and then you can talk to the prof if you're interested in the research that they are doing. So here she talks about, in fact, if you go to the research, she talks about the type of research that she's doing. She's doing something in system design and development of smart materials or smart uh, systems, experimental characterization and all these kind of things, all right? So it means that if my field or if I'm interested in this field, I can actually write to this prof. Now, that is what we are gonna be talking about here in terms of what type of emails do you send? How do you send them? And what, what do you need to send to the prof, okay? That's why I wanted to show you how to find the prof in the first. So at least if you can go to Google, type the name of the school or type the name of wherever you want to go and go to the department. All the profs are listed there, their telephone numbers, their emails and everything. All right. Now, the caution. In fact, it was one of the main things that actually motivated us to start this program. And the reason is that it seems there's nobody in Ghana who is coaching Ghanaians to contact profs. Okay, and so if you look at the emails that the profs get from US, they get from um, Germany, they get from um, China, from Iran, it's very different from when you get an email from somebody from Ghana or Nigeria. Okay, so the main thing is that connecting to the prof and contacting the prof is important, but you really have to be careful how you contact the prof because your first contact um, email can actually what disconnect you from this whole process, okay? All right, let me show you one simple thing before we come back to the slide. People are raising their hands, but I want to, can you write down your questions so that we look at it later on, okay? As simple as sending an email to the prof, attaching your CV and your transcript to the prof, okay? And then letting them know that you saw their profile and you are very interested in the research that they are doing. Okay, that is what is as simple as that. Okay, and then you can attach your CV, you can attach your transcript, you can have publications, you can attach maybe a picture of the first page of the publication or where we can actually find the publication. Okay, so it's as simple as simple as simple as that. But remember, you have to write a concise and a professional letter. If I show you some of the emails from Africa, okay, like Nigeria, Ghana, um, Egypt, you'll be worried. Why? Because they just write a simple thing. They don't add their transcript, they don't add their CV, and even those who add their CV, very terrible with, with whatever CV they have, okay? So the main thing is that you have to be as concise as possible. You have to be very, very professional, okay? Very professional. That is one of the main things I want you to get from this. Now, make sure you attach your CV and your unofficial transcript or whatever. You need to add your CV and transcript because I will first look at your transcript before I even go and look at your CV, all right? Because people have awesome CVs, but then the transcripts are not really, really good. Because, hey, you are coming to school, if the transcript is not good, then what are we going to do, right? Now, this applies to whether you are going to do medicine or you are going to the biological sciences, you are going to social sciences, you are going to the arts, wherever. Political science is the same thing. I have friends who are doing PhD in political science here, and they use the same thing. They wrote the prof. And then prof was really happy with their stuff, the blah, 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 and then things got, um, got off from that angle. So it's as simple as writing an email to the prof, but please, please, be very, very concise and very professional about it, okay? And make sure that you add your CV and your transcript, okay? That is one of the main things that you need. And beside that, Beside that, this is the problem from one of the, you know, one of the problems from Africa. Somebody will send me an email. My name is blah, 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 blah. Nice email with a transcript and everything. But they tell me, I want to do research on aircraft landing gears, okay? As soon as I see that, I delete or I'll just reply that, oh, look, um, I don't have money for aircraft um, landing gears. So thank you very much. I don't have an opening right now. Why do I say that? Make sure that you are, not be, you are not being so specific. I know we all, I did aerospace engineering from KNUST, but right now all my research is in material science. Why? Because the problem that I got to sponsor me, they didn't have money for aerospace engineering. He had money for materials engineering. And here I am, I'm doing materials engineering now. Okay, so this whole thing can really sway you off from your field or it can sway you off from whatever you are interested in. So if you really are not interested in the field that the prof is working in, don't contact them in the first place. Okay, don't, because you're going to be doing something that you regret for the rest of your life. 
Okay. So if the prof is doing something on, let's say, GIS systems, and I'm very interested in GIS systems, of course, I'm going to write to the prof and say that I saw your research profile on GIS, blah, 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 blah. And I'm interested in your research. And I wanted to know if you have any open position for a graduate student. In that case, you leave your options open. You don't kind of say, okay, I want to do this and this and this and this. And the reason is that I might not have money for that. Okay, so right now, um, let's go to uh, my page. I want to share something with you, okay? okay? So if you go to my research website right now, this is my research website, okay? And then I have a whole bunch of things. I talk about the research areas that I'm working on, okay? I have my lab team. You can actually see them here. We have so many things that goes on, you know, and all that. All right. If you come to my research field, I have four main things here, okay? Now, the question is, you don't know which of them I have money for right now, okay? I can tell you that right now, I have money for the first one. I don't have money for the, the last one, this one, okay? And so if somebody contacts me that they want to do this type of research, I'll tell them that, hey, thank you very much for your interest in my research. I don't have any open position right now. So why don't you leave your options very open rather than being very, very specific, okay? That is one. Two, people send their emails and then they copy two, three different props. I have somebody from Ghana, he sent me an email and then he copied three other props. Now, that is a no, 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 no. And the reason is that, one, all the props meet and talk. And so you sending an email to three props, it shows that you really are not serious. You don't even know what you want to do. You just want to leave Ghana, right? And that is really a no, no, no. So imagine yeah, one department has about maybe 30 or 40 props and you want to pick different props and send emails to them. You have to be particular about it and send to one prop at a time. And you have to really tailor the, the email to the props what research and leave your options what open. So if somebody tells me that, oh, I'm from KNUSC Material Science Engineer, I had a first class, blah, blah, blah. I graduated in 2019 and I wanted to find out if you have any open position in material. I'm very interested in your research profiles, especially A, B, and C, blah, 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 that kind of thing. In that case, you leave your options open. Okay? You leave your options open. And then you send to one prop at a time, attach your CV, attach your transcript. Okay. So that is one of the things that I want to really bring out because I see a lot of the emails from Ghana and they are sending it to different profs. If the email doesn't even have um, like a simple thank you to finish, they don't write their names. In fact, some of the emails that people even used to send, so one, I got an email and then it says what? Um, something, something, um, something, something, um, what? Post. It's like a very unprofessional email. All right. And that's what they were using to send. Look, even with the professional ones, I'm deleting them. So you give me a reason to delete yours, right? And that's the same for all the props. It's not like they are being disrespectful, but I wake up in the morning, I have over 120 emails to respond to. You think I have time to be looking for students? No, I'm just going to delete everything, right? I'm just going to delete everything that comes in there. So it's important to really know what you are writing and being what professional about how you write it. And then you, tell, you don't tell them that you want money or anything. You don't tell them that you want sponsorship or anything, no. You tell them that you want to join their research team. And they know very well that if they pick you to join their research team, it means they are going to give you money to pay your, your what, accommodation and your tuition fees and all that. Okay? That's the main thing. All right. Any questions on this, please? Before I move on, just on this part. If it's not no, on this I have part, a question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, so you keep saying you keep deleting um, most of the emails that come your way. So how exactly do I catch your attention? So when you see my email, you do not delete it. Nice. That's a good question. So one of the What's, first... Is it, is it a subject I have to put no, in place good. or something? No, it's good. It's good. Now, one of the first things you have to do is that, when, for example, in my case, when I wrote the email to the prof, Luckily for me, I knew somebody who was from Ghana and he was also a student at the department. So I sent an email to the person that this is what I'm doing, can they follow up for me? And then they went to the prof's office and they spoke to the prof about me and that was it, okay? So one of the main things that the Indians and then the Iranians have been doing is that they will send the email to the prof, but they will send their friend who is in the school or wherever 
to go what follow up for them. And that's a very good strategy, I can assure you that. At least 70% of those people who get good responses because at least I know that there's somebody from that department and then they are, they are, they are already here. And this person is actually what um, um, kind of um, canvassing for somebody else who I know is going to be a good deal. So it's a good, it's a good thing to, if you have somebody there to contact them. Two, I have people who call my office phone. Who call my office phone that, hey, um, I have submitted my application to you. I wanted to find out if you have an open position. I did not get an, um, a reply back and I know you are busy, but I wanted to find out if you have any, uh, if you are accepting new students. That's a good option too. You can call them on their phone. If you go online right now, all of them, they have their mobile phones, there, like their office phone numbers there, and they do pick up. So it's, it's a good time to, 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 to talk about that, right? Now, one other thing that um, my very good friend, I'm not sure if he's on, George. Is George on? Yeah, so George talked about this last time that, as I said- Yeah, so I'm here, I'm yes. here. So George, do you want to talk about the time to send and then some of the experiences you've had with that? All right, yeah, so- like as Solo is saying, the timing is also very crucial. For instance, we are in Ghana now, it's almost 7 p.m. And if I wanna send an email to a professor in Canada, first thing that you also have to look at is the time difference. Because if, for instance, Solo keeps saying he deletes his emails he deletes his emails because when he gets to the office in the morning, he has over 100 emails. And obviously, we are, those of us working, if you go to the office in the morning and you have a lot of things to do, the least thing that you want to be looking at is someone who wants to, you know, you to look at his CV or transcript or something. But then... Toward all of us, those of us who work, or even, I mean, almost all of us, towards the end of the day, you realize that you are a bit liberal, you're a bit free. Or maybe after lunch, you want to, you know, catch some small time to rest before doing anything. So if a professor wants to look at it, the right time to make sure your email gets to the professor is at these times that ideally he'll be free. So if you want to send an email to your professor, let's say in Canada, and you know that they would close office at 4 p.m. Around, um, around this time, there's a, probably a time difference of uh, between four to six hours, depending on where the professor is located in Canada. So you now have to factor in that time into when you send the email. So if it's, let's say, a six hour time difference, then you know that when it's 10 p.m. here in Ghana, then we're we'll roughly around 4 p.m. in Canada. The professor, maybe if there's lectures or supervision or anything, is a bit free at that time. So there's a high chance of the professor reading the email. Or if you want to hit the lunchtime period, most universities professors between 12 and maybe 1.30, they go for their lunch. They're a bit free after lunch. So it's a high problem. Remember, in the morning, they've already deleted mo most of the email that they, they, they got in the night. So at that point in time, you have a higher chance of your email being read. So the timing is also very crucial. You don't just send it at your convenience. Try to send it at the right time where you have the higher probability of professor reading. And you can always be sure they'll read it when they probably you know, are a bit less busy. For example, in my experience, I was sending an email to a professor and I did all the time difference calculations and everything. And the time difference between me and where I did my PhD was two hours. They are two hours ahead. So I sat down, I realized that, okay, if I wanted to hit his email around 4.30, so I sent it around 2.30. And within, in less than five minutes, he replied and gave me the offer. And I did the same approach that we are teaching here. I sent my CV, I sent my transcript, I reviewed his profile a bit, made sure I tailored my, my CV and my emails and everything to suit his profile. 
I read one or two of his papers and made sure I threw in some jargons for him to know that I really know what I'm talking about. I made sure the email was very professional because I am a physicist. So if I want to hit someone who's also a physicist, we have our language. So you don't just write a mere email that hey, make sure within the email, at least if you want to join his group, if you express interest in his group, make sure you have one or two sentences in your email for him to know that, yes, this person has really reviewed my profile. This person has really looked at the research I'm doing and knows what he's talking about. And once you have that and you throw those things in, you hit him at the right time and get it, you have a high chance of getting a response. So if you're able to get the content right, the weddings right, and everything right, and you tailor your CV and things to suit the professor, trust me, if you get on the, their good list, their good side, most likely they would find somewhere, note you down and will contact you when the time is right. So the timing is also key. Again, in terms of timing, most countries, and for lack of a better expression, I'm um, with reference to Ghana, I would say most serious countries where they have um, research pool where professors bid for funding from this research pool, there are times where they release funding for these projects. So there may be times in the year where the professor would ideally want you, but there is no funding. And there are times in the year when they have funds because that is when the funding agencies release the money. So if you it all boils down to doing a bit of extensive research. If you are able to find out, for instance, in Canada, around this time, if you ask them for money, they most likely not have money for you. But from January thereabout, most of them will be getting feedbacks from the funding applications, which was due, I think Soloma is get correct me there, somewhere the first week in November. So now it's all under review. So at this time, if you send them, they don't have money because they are expecting some money, but the money is not in. But if you get them somewhere in November where they are getting feedback, well, as soon as they get feedback and they have funding, trust me, they are eager for students because you have to report to the funding agency that the stipulated time that you said you will start, you started and you have students. So seasonal timing is key as well as daily timing is also important. I'm sure I'll, I'll leave it here for now. Amame, I hope it answers your question. And if there are further questions, we can discuss them as we go along. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, um, Dr. George. And, uh, Hello. Hello. Let's wrap Hello. this up and then we'll go back to the questions. Okay, let's wrap Hello. this up. Okay. So please just, just let's wrap this up and then we'll go back. All right. So okay. so one of the main things that we talked about is that be very professional. And as um, Dr. George said. There are so many ways that you can actually use to get attention of the prof. One of the best ways, the time is important. As he said, early in the morning, I'm deleting emails. But in the afternoon, when one comes in, I can respond. It's easy, all right? And so it makes it easier. And two, don't send emails on weekends. Because right now, I'm not reading. On Monday, I'll have about 200 emails in my box. I will have to delete a lot of them to filter you know, the most important things out, all right? So again, timing is important, all right? And as he said, Right now, nobody has money because of what the application mm -hmm. submitted under review. So from mm -hmm. let's say March, everybody would have heard about the application and then they'll be hiring. Again, profs can keep your file and then they'll get back to you. That is depends on how you wrote your stuff and what you attach to it. All right, the transcript, the quality of the transcript, the CV, and everything. It talks a lot about the type of student that we are coming in. And again, what the props are looking out for is somebody who can do research, a smart person. It doesn't mean you have to be like, you know, an awesome student, no way. But it depends on the approach, okay, and how you do these contacts and everything. All right, some props also oh, okay. important if you add a research statement, okay? So for example, if you look at the research that the prof is doing now, I'll caution everybody against it. Don't, 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 don't draft one nice email and send to 10 profs, okay, at different times. No, you always have to channel the type of email you are writing to the research that the prof is doing, okay? So if you are going to do something in, let's say, um, artificial intelligence or computer science, something on um, 
um, maybe smart something, all right? You really have to mention that in your email for the prof to know that at least this student has taken the liberty of going online to look at my profile before coming in contact with me, all right? It's good, it, it speaks a lot about you as well. Some people add research statements, and again, some is good, some in some cases, in other cases, not good because we, if you really don't tone down your research statement, it becomes too specific. And the prof, as I said, if you ask me to um, give you money for research on aircraft landing gears, I will not have the money. But if you tell me that you want to do something on 3D printing of materials, I will have the money for you, right? That kind of thing. Two, if you let somebody follow up for you, it's a good thing. You can follow up with a phone call, whatever. Now again, don't keep on sending the emails because it got deleted. No, no, no. You have to find another way, all right? Because as I showed you in my email, the student kept on sending every time and also kept on deleting, right? Your repetitive, your repetitive um, emails will not gonna, is not going to help you in any way because, look, I'm not just looking at it. I'm not, all right? And two, if you write a research statement, make sure that it's really kind of a little bit general. Don't be too specific else. It pushes you away from what the purpose are. Now, this is for the money to come in. When you come into, or before you come, there are other things like you have TA positions, you have um, fellowships, scholarships, and all that that you can apply to. All of them are there, but they are very, very competitive, right? And so the best way that everybody really works around this whole thing is to contact a prof who is willing to find All right, right now, um, let's move on. We'll come back to this. So you can find the contact emails, the phone numbers, office times, everything of the prof. Now, I have people from Iran, but the Iranians are doing a good job, I can assure you that, okay? Iranians, they send me emails, they go and find me on LinkedIn and send me email on LinkedIn, they go and find me on whatever, like whatever platform you are on, they are finding you and sending you emails. Well, you would think it's a bad, but hey, if they really have what I'm looking out for, why not? Maybe they are forcing me to look at what they have, all right? So it's really a smart way around things that you can actually watch, um, address this. Now, let's say you contact the prof and the prof says yes. It's not like it just it's not going to be a yes straight away. A lot of them will call you and interview you. Okay, a lot of them will call you, and I'll give you a scenario. Uh, my two of my students are online, so they can attest to this. The, my students are doing a very good job at York University. So there's a prof there who saw them and like, oh wow, the students even come to work on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, I want to get two Ghanaian students to try and see if they are this good, right? And quickly, I told them to get them somebody from Kenya. So they got these first class students from Kenya and other places. And then the profs called them for interview. Now, remember, if the prof wants you, okay, they will call you for an interview to ask you a few questions. What are they trying to find out? They want to find out whether you know something about the research that they are doing and at least the fundamental knowledge in that area. So a lot of the profs will call you for an interview. I can, I can guarantee you that. So when they call you, they really want to know, does this person really have the fundamental knowledge in the field? Do they know something about what I'm doing? Can they really adapt to what I'm doing? You know, these students, they had first class, but the interview was really, really poorly done. I didn't know. In the morning, I went to campus, I saw this province like, wow, how did these people get first class from Ghana? Because he was asking them basic questions. And according to him, these people really did poorly. And that's it, they didn't get the offer. Even though the prof has already was said yes. Okay. So the interview alone can throw you off. So what do I advise? If a prof contacts you that, okay, he wants to do an interview, yes. quickly go to their website and read something about their work. Try and read something fundamental about the work that they are doing. So I'm in material science. You look at my research, a lot of the things is on 3D printing and you know, computational modeling, those kind of things. So at least quickly, you can find some few things to read on Google just to arm up yourself with something so that you can answer answer those things when they ask you. But if you just, but you know, no. because you have a first class and you think that's it, no way. The interview alone can throw you off. That is one thing that I want you to um, get at the back of your mind, okay? So um, with the CV, I'll come back to the questions. With the CV, please, there's a very good um, um, write-up on how to come up with these very good CVs, all right? How do you write a CV? And add cover letters. Uh, now, Ghana CVs have birth date. Some of them even have their citizenship and the, whether they are Christian or not. I'm like, really? After university, you still write a CV with whether you're a Christian or what? Where did you go to school? You know. So please, these things have to really change. All right. 
I see CVs and then they have their birthdays. I'm a Christian and they have what? A male. Look, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. In fact, it really shows where we are coming from. Nobody wants that. Okay. Go straight to the point. If you don't know how to prepare a good CV, please find out how to do that. Okay. We have some other videos on how to prepare good CVs. All right. Because it speaks a lot about you. If you are writing emails, um, your CVs with your um your religion in there, your date of birth in there, and I'm like, really, you know, who does that nowadays? All right. So please make sure you're writing good CVs. And don't write a lot in the emails that you send to the prof. It has to be very concise, straight to the point, and let them know that at least you have read something about their profile from your from the website that they have. Okay. Don't send multiple emails to the same prof. And don't send one email to multiple props at the same time. Okay. And I have something on there. I'll post this so people can actually have access to it on the CV. All right. So that is that is really the main thing. Now, if the prop actually says yes, trust me, you are, you are coming in. If he says no, you have to keep on looking. Okay. I had already sent emails to a lot of the props, and all of them said no. Now, with this one, the reason why I got in was because my friend went there. And he spoke to the prof on my behalf. And that's how I came to Canada. All right. My emails and everything didn't do it. It's because somebody went in there to talk. All right. So all these things are very, very important. Following up, how to follow up, talk to the, talk to your friends, talk to people to just go in. And then, you know, uh, you can actually get some of these opportunities. And as George said, some of the schools are, profs are not looking. Some of them are looking. And I, I have a platform. I'll be sharing some of the profs that I know they are looking. So that if you are from that field, you can actually contact them. Now, one thing that maybe might not be that good is for people who want to do MBA. So MBA, I know they also do some of these things, but MBA is a little bit different. Okay, And the reason is that they don't do heavy research. Some of them do, but um, usually for MBA, you would have to pay your way out. Okay. Now, two, if you have a second class lower, let me give you a scenario, second class lower. I have somebody who has a second class lower and the person really had a good info about me. Okay, so they, 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 I'm looking for somebody who is very good with what we call, if you are from engineering, we call something finite element analysis. Okay. And I'm looking for a student who has a great deal of expertise in this field. This guy has a second class lower, but he had done a lot of computational modeling and simulation. And so he had a lot of experience in finite element modeling. That is what I need. Whether he has a second class law or whatever. So far as he can meet the admission criteria, I'll pick him. That's it. Okay. So having a second class lower, one of the things you can do is either you do a master's program somewhere in Ghana or something so that the attention will shift from your undergrad to your master's or you really find the profs and the field you want to go to and learn some of the things that they really need. In that way, you become an asset to the prof. So if you are really good at finite element analysis, I really don't care whether you have a first class or second class law or whatever. I'm looking for this. And so I'm going for, for you. That's it. You have, you have, the, you have the, the, the job, you know? And it, it's something that people don't know. They think that if I have a first class or if I have a second class law, that's it, I'm done. No, it's not. And if you do a master's, again, it shifts the attention from the master's to the, um, the undergrad to the master's. And lastly, before I wrap up this one, if you have, um, let's say, a lower and you, can, you cannot do a master's, you cannot actually upgrade your, um, um, yourself with some of the softwares and everything that they have, you can apply to do a diploma or a certificate program. Okay, That is also part of the things that they do here in Canada. And with that, you have to pay on your own. Or you can find your own money. Let's say right now, if somebody sends me an email that, hello, Professor Solomon, I have my own funding. I want to come and do my master's under your supervision. That's it. I'll pick you. Hey, I'm not paying. Why not? <laughs> okay. So people do that, especially from Nigeria. I get emails from Nigeria where they have their own money and they want to come and do their master's under my supervision. So in that case, if I really look at their staff and I talk to them, I think they are good. I'll pick them. Okay. And that is, that is how some of the people actually come up. All right. So now if you have questions on this educational thing, I want to answer them before we move on to the work permit and then the permanent residency things. Okay? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Please go ahead. Um, speaking of the, the, the timing, mm -hmm. so, uh, suppose, supposedly we, we all get this timing right. 
and uh, again the hundred emails comes in. What, what happens? Do you said lip some? Can you please come again? I said, uh, as you know, we all get this timing right. Mm -hmm. And the again the the, the hundred emails or even more flow, comes in. Mm -hmm. When you do the listening again. Yeah. So it's then then it's it's so this is the issue. Uh, there are so many props. There is no way that everybody be writing to me. No, okay. People are writing to other props and all that. Okay, so when it comes, mm -hmm. but since we cannot send uh, the email to different props, only one props. Yeah, you can send to. You have to send one to one prop at a time. For example, somebody sent me an email that they want to do research in tissue engineering. Right away, there's a flag because look, did you even see my profile? I'm not doing anything on tissue engineering. So why will you send me such an email that you want to do something tissue engineering, all right? So this student obviously is not a good student. I'm not even going to read the email. As soon as I see something, I'll just delete it, all right? Because, hey, it doesn't. So there are ways that, um, let's say we all send it to the prop at the same time. Trust me, it's not going to be one prop at the same time. But again, if I'm looking, I'm looking. If I'm not looking, I'm not looking. That's it. And since we are talking about the same thing, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm considering the student who has been sending you the email and you keep on listening. We are, we, are, we, are, we are talking about attention. He has gotten your attention. You are aware that he's trying to reach out to you and you keep mm -hmm. on listening. So I'm just assuming if I'm the one, mm -hmm. what, 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 how, well, how uh, can I get your attention again? Okay, so you want, you want admission to school, right? And you are sending me your CV. What will I do with your CV? I need a transcript and I need a CV as well, right? So this person is not getting the basics right. He's sending me um, only um, CV without transcript. How do I judge whether this is a good student or not? Okay, because I want somebody who is smart, who can do the research in the lab, and then I also get what the the worth of my money, right? So in that case, the the the, the foundation is really not right. You, you can't send me only your CV and you keep on sending me your CV. What am I going to do with it? I want to see your transcript. What did you do? What did you get? That kind of thing, right? So that is the issue. And two, if I'm not looking, regardless of how you catch my attention, I'm not looking. I'm only going to keep your profile or your transcript and your CV is very good. And I'll contact you if I have money. And I think, and just as Dr. George said, um, our friend got the same offer in that same format, right? Write to the prop, oh, I don't have money now. Your staff is really good. I'm going to keep it and I'll get in touch. Sometimes I've kept people's profile I've contacted them even though they never wrote back to me to find out whether they are still looking. You know what I mean? Okay, so let, let me let me chip in here. You see, one thing that we should all have at the back of our minds, and we, we, let's let's be honest. It is not easy to get full funding. You need you need to have a a, a tough skin. Now as I don't know if I get the name right. April is saying, or his his, his interest is his, his inquiry. You have everything right. You send it, and you're still getting deleted. What do you do? Then you should, or if you are really interested in the group, then like what I said, the timing. You get a timing and everything. You may get the 24-hour timing time difference right. But maybe you are not getting the seasonal or the fund allocation time where the grant proposals hit. And honestly, if you send and you are not getting a reply, it may be two things. Either the professor doesn't have money or the professor or your, your profile doesn't meet his expectation. Now, if you do the background search and everything well, and to you, you have of the convict, you have the conviction that. You really meet the professor's pro, uh, research uh, profile, and you are you are sure of yourself that you meet his criteria. Then what you can look at is look. Once you prepare the letter and you save it, it's there. Try to now also look at the seasonal time where you send it. So that would also mean you have to do a little bit of further research, and that's why I say it's not easy. Little bit of further research to find out. That specific country, do they have a research pool? If they do, when do they release funding to these professors? Areas? And all this information are online. You can really get them. So if you are sure you meet the criteria, but you are not getting a response, 
do a little bit research, try to find out about the seasonal thing and try to hit again at the right time where you are sure based on the online that they started getting feedback. And in that case, if you use the time difference and everything, you are most likely to get a feedback. If you don't get that one too, and you are still really interested, remember on their website, their telephone numbers are there. Most of them, honestly, what I've also realized, I, I tried applying for one or two schools in Canada and the professor really didn't, wasn't really sure if I could speak English because fine, I can type English, but can I really communicate in English because there's writing and there's speaking and comprehension. So sometimes going the extra step of calling them also helps because then if they had any doubts that your English is not really a par with them, you speak it and then they know. So that doubt is there, it's cleared. And then also at least it shows that you are really making the effort. So as to getting the emails deleted, trust me, you delete a lot of them. And even me, I delete all my emails, but then the right ones that are good, if you send them at the right time, we'll look at them. If you don't get back to you, they don't even get back to you. If you really meet their expectations, you will get a response. Thank you, Solo, continue. All right, so please, any other questions before we move on to the work permit and then the permanent residency, which I think um, is also something that uh, everybody's really interested. Yeah, please, I yeah. have a question. Yes, please go ahead. All right, I'm, I'm Jonathan. Hello. Uh, yes, I, I, I want to know about um, uh, the, the, uh, the second, you were talking about it, but I, in fact, I couldn't get it clearer. Our uh, those who have second class, lower um, class, uh, how you can go about it? Okay. So with the second class, lower, one of the things you can do is actually to do a master's in Ghana. Now, for admission to the school, you can easily get. And the reason is that when you are calculating your GPA, it, it, they calculate it from your fourth and third years. Okay. So they don't use your first and second year for their calculation of GPA. They use only your last two years. All right. So with that, you can qualify for admission, but the only challenge is that maybe because of the competitiveness of looking for funding, a prof might not get back to you. So one of the things that people do is that they do a master's in Ghana, and at least once you have a master's, then it shifts your, the attention of the prof from your undergrad to your master's. In fact, I would prefer somebody who has a master's in Ghana, and the reason is that they know how to do research already. I'm not going to be teaching them how to do research and they know the importance of research. They can actually maneuver their way around the research and all that. So it's a good thing. All right. Now, second thing. Uh, is, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what about um, um, some of us who, uh, who, who have a research or a master's degree program in other countries like UK, which is no. not in Ghana? No, it's good. Wherever you are. So let's say you, are, you have a master's from UK or PhD from UK. Right? Yes, uh, yes, yes, please. Yeah, Master's you can, in UK. It's, 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 it's really good. You can apply with it. That's it. It doesn't have to come from wherever. Surprise, the master's degree, that's it. You know, now the only problem is that I've seen people come to a department from Norway and then from Netherlands and all those places. And then the prof says that even though they have a master's, they won't offer them a PhD because they think that they should do a master's again. And the reason is that here, when we talk about master's, MSc, you are not going to be doing coursework a lot. You will be doing a lot of the research. So if they see that where you are coming from, you didn't do a lot of research, then I, I, I'll be scared to offer you a PhD because you might be stuck. You wouldn't know what to do, right? So in that case, even though you are coming from UK, if I realize that you didn't do research, you were just doing coursework, I would ask you to do the master's again because unless, you know, I really, you don't have any research experience. And here, 90% of your thing is going to be on research, right? So how then do I even, uh, how then do I, do I know whether you're going to be able to do the research or not? So it's, it's, it's that kind of um, a challenge, right? But if you did research in your master's, that's really awesome. That's it. Okay. And people who have been, let's say somebody has been um, a nurse for, let's say, a long time and they now want to go back to school and do a, P, a, a master's. It's really, really good. You know why? You have a lot of experience from the field. And so that is what you should be talking about in your email and then in your CV. 
for me to know that, look, this person has been out of school for a long time, but they have a lot of experience that is really important for the research that I'm doing. They can actually apply their experience in the research. And that becomes a good thing um, for you. Oh, thank, thank you very much for that. I, just to cut uh, short, um, a colleague um, who is a physician assistant here in Ghana, uh, completed 2016, has around four to five years work experience, mm -hmm. who is also eager to do a master's program um, in a Canada, but uh, has a second class lower. Okay. And how does the person go about it? So, so, so with that, all right, if you contact the prof, so let's say they've been working for a long time in the field, all right, and they did something on A, B, and C, you just have to find a prof who is actually doing a research on the specific things that you were doing at your workplace, all right? So let's say you were in the cardiology department and you were assisting with something like that. You would have to find a prof who is doing research on cardiology, and then you contact them that, look, I did this, and I have a lot of experience in this, and I really want to do your research. And they know very well that the experience that you are, you are really bringing on board will help you to do the research. So in that case, it becomes easier for you to even work in the field. Now, profs are not looking for smart people. We are looking for people who can do their research, okay? So if you can okay. sell yourself that you are somebody who is interested in research in Canada, research is the main thing. Canada, if you, that's one of the, the things I like about Canada. If somebody comes to Canada today to do a PhD, Today, they will start the research. If you come to do a master's, today you will start the master's. If you go to US, you have to do coursework for over a year or two years before you start with the research. But in Canada, if you come today, in my lab, if you come from Ghana today, tomorrow you are going to the lab to work, right? And before you realize, it's like, if the person really is not interested in research, then they, they kind of begin to fall apart because they really don't like what they are doing. It's not about coursework. It's about somebody who can really interpret the things that they are seeing, somebody who can work with a machine, somebody who can apply the knowledge that they actually acquired in the field. That is what we are doing right here. So if you can sell yourself as a researcher rather than as a student, it becomes very easy. Oh. All right, all right, all right. Okay. All right. Let, let, me, let me also chip in here to, to uh, uh, for Jonathan. You said your your friend or the, this person is a physician assistant who had second class Lua and has five year working experience. Now what yeah. you should take note is that for masters and PhD, it is purely research oriented. Now this person has second class Lua. It's fine as uh, Solomon was saying, uh, they mostly look at your last two years and not so what you did in first year because mostly in Ghana first year is where we do the non far courses. And then the last two years is what you really focus on your, your, your area. Now, this person who has five year working experience, what I would advise and a way to go about it is that on his CV, he should translate his working experience as a physician assistant into research oriented fields. For instance, in Ghana, most CVs we write, uh, for instance, I'm a teacher. If I'm a teacher, I would probably be saying that, look, I teach and handle courses, I do this, which is mostly what people do. You know, uh, TAs, they'll say they are a teaching assistant and they were uh, grading student courses or helping them do laboratory work. That is a bit vague. But then the same thing, for instance, with a physician assistant, if the person just helps the doctor, what aspects of the physician assistantship can the person translate professionally into a research oriented uh, angle. So the five years experience, you go to the hospital, you are taking uh, what blood pressure, you are treating people for malaria or doing that, doing that. Can they, can the person find a way to relate his everyday activity in the hospital to something that can you know, you can churn a research topic out of or a research area out of. And then on his CV that a person can write that for him. So instead of basically saying, I go, I treat people for malaria, you can, you know, why you can look at it as a research perspective, but okay, in that area, there are this, this, this aspects which you think uh, are the causes of malaria. 
So as a risk physician assistant, you are, as I treating, you are investigating why A, B, C is also causing malaria and what you can do. So it's your normal, because normal doctors, when you go, they would ask you, maybe I take that and all, then, then try to do that mosquito net mode, and this, all those things. So you try to find causes, but let the person try to have a strong CV that projects, translates his five-year working experience into something researchable to support that after completing school for five years and working for five years, the person still has some rudiments of research in his work, which will now support the second class lower the person got. So now experience will now come in. And once you have good experience and you support the academic prospects, all things being equal, you should be at par with someone who had a first class or something. I, I hope you, you, you get the impulse of what I'm saying. Yeah, I have, yeah, I have yeah, a yeah, question yeah, I want to yeah. come in. So basically, are you telling us that uh, masters in the Canada is more research oriented as opposed to, you know, in yeah. Europe where you have coursework? Yeah. And... No, 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 no. Nobody really cares about your coursework. My students are online here. They are part of this presentation. You can ask them. I always tell them that I really uh -huh. don't care about your coursework, okay? All I want is my okay. research, my publications. And trust me, um, they do few, like for masters in Canada, you do about five or six courses. That's it. Oh, that's all. Four, wow. four or five courses, you are done with your coursework. Then, and, uh -huh. and the prof really doesn't care about that. What they care about is the quality oh, okay. of the research. Right? The so the coursework, the are you graded or you're not graded? Oh, at you all? are graded, of course. A oh, plus okay. and all that, yeah. But it's really, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean it's anything. It's not their focus. Yeah. The main thing, look, for research here, is the general publications the students are coming up with. That is what oh. sells. In fact, that is a selling card. If you come and do a master's program, a PhD program, and you don't publish general papers, you are doomed. The system is just going to swallow you up. Okay. okay. So what if before I, I even apply to the master's, I've already published some journals? That's, so that's yeah. really good. If I have a student who oh, tells okay. me that, oh, and that's what the Iranians are doing. I have Iranians sending me uh, emails always, and they tell me that well, I have four general papers already. And it's a good thing. I'm happy because, hey, this guy already knows research, you know? And that's research. it. In Ghana, it's, it's difficult. People coming from Ghana, I'm not quite sure how they are. But hey, you did um, capstone, or what do you call it? Um, project work, right? But just yeah, like, yeah. you know, you can, some of them in Ghana, they publish it. So you can actually sell that, that, okay, you have some experience in risk. You have to prove that you have experience in research. In research, yeah. You have to, because research is what sells here as a, a master student, a PhD student. If you can't prove that, okay. unless you are a super student, then I, I'll pick you because I know oh, you okay. can adapt. Yeah. Okay, so you're not looking for people coming to read courses? No, and no, 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 Okay, no, no. okay. Then in Why that would case, I pay our, your tuition our... fees? Then in that case, our undergraduates should also be encouraged in, this, in that direction that uh, our students will be more research oriented. So but, by the time- You know, finish, they, they have it. So see, they have it. They, they, okay. they just don't know they, don't, they have it. People go do attachment every long vacation. Attachment, yeah. what do you do in the attachment? When you go there, you get you have some industrial experience that can be translated easily to a research experience. Research. So, so um, in you know? Ghana attachment, they go, they send them to buy one chikuku. <laughs> me, me, my, attach, me, my att attachment in Ghana at uh, mechanical, I was greasy now. Yeah, but that's, that's 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 okay. You see, I, I I did aerospace. My attachment, I did um welding of coal pot at Ghana Air Force. Uh. <laughs> but look, look, no, let me show you. Okay. You think it's you think it's not a good experience, it's a very good experience. Why? Okay. If you are applying to a prof who is into material science, I'm welding yeah. coal pot. Welding is a big topic in materials engineering. And so okay. I can easily tell the prof that I have a lot of experience in welding yeah. and blah 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 blah. And that's it. People just don't know. People are working at um Temaoi refinery and all that, they don't know how to translate their experiences towards research. Yeah. So that is a whole topic on its own, how to translate Because this, this is the same when I went to like Germany, as soon as I got to the, and even undergraduate course, as soon as I got to the undergraduate course, they pushed me straight to the lab and I started exactly. doing research, research. So I, I, I'm a bit like, well, I was wondering, okay, so this means this is exactly what you guys are doing in, yeah. in Canada, straight to yeah. the lab, yeah. do the analysis, bring yeah. it to the, the, bring the report to the professor. Okay. Exactly. Okay. That's great. Exactly. All right. 
So Hello, let's bro. wrap up on this on this bro, part of bro. education so that we move on to the, 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 the Hello, permits. Bro. Okay, let's talk about that. Now, uh, one thing is that I have... So I think, I think Yawamwa has been wanting Hello, to ask Yaw, a question please, for a long time. The last one, question. and then we will move on, okay? We have to yes. finish with the work yes. permit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes, I have a, a, a question, but it's quite tailored um, to, to, to my, my persona. Sure. So I have a um, second class degree mm -hmm. from tech. Okay. Second class lower from tech. And okay. I have over 10 years working experience in mm -hmm. the bank. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm an IT guy. So I work nice. with Zenon Bank, Zenon Limited in the IT department. Nice. I worked in, with customer service. I've also worked in uh, database management, and I was mainly in charge of software, the main core banking application that, that the bank was using. And currently, I'm doing my master's in um, computer applications in India. So I'm currently in India. Mm -hmm. You know, and I want to. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Did we lose Yao? Okay. In the Japan, our internet is a good man. Yeah. So, 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 as as Yao Yao is saying, all right, you have you have a lot of experience. Okay. The issue is how do you translate those experience into what a very good CV to show that you have research experience. In fact, in your case, you are lucky. You are even doing a master's program, so you don't even have a problem. All the attention is going to be on the master's program, what you are doing in the master's. So it's you you have you have all the the right things. So one thing I'm oh, doing is that anytime I see any open position, people who have contacted me, I send it to them. So wow. if okay. I see a prof, if I see a prof who is looking for a student and then they ask me and you, you are in my database, I just send it to you. All right. Wow. Prof is doing something very good because if you come to yeah. where I work, consultation is 300 just to talk to the lawyer you know, mm. to get all these advices and stuff. And Prof is trying his best to make things easy. Do you get it? So you guys should like encourage people. If you see that Prof has put today event buys, whatever, pay for it. It's it's not something that you're not going to get something out of. Do you get it? So you should also try and support Prof. Spread the yeah, news. But, yeah, yeah, you know, um, I'm, I'm a Ghanaian, so why not? Why don't we help Ghanaians? And trust yeah. me, Ghanaians are very smart. When they come here, they do very well. And I can, yeah. if I tell you the number of Ghanaian professors in Canada, you'd be shocked. People just don't know them. Every single, almost every single university um, has at least one Ghanaian prof I know. Almost, almost. Not everyone, though. Okay, so please, yeah. a lot of these profs are looking for students. Let me give you an example. I only have students from Ghana and some Iranian students right now. I'm looking to diversify my research group. So I'm looking at um, China and some other places. The same way, a lot of the profs also have opportunities um, for um, white students because they are white, right? And they want to diversify their research group. So they want to look outside for blacks and all these kinds of things. But no, black is really sending. And those who are sending are really sending horrible stuff, all right? And so we're like, okay, let's help people to write good stuff to profs, get them connected. And that's it, you get, you get opportunities right now. Okay, yeah. So please, we've been talking for too long. We've taken your time for almost like um, four or five hours. I think yeah. it's, a, it's a good place to, to stop. And um, thank you very much for coming and staying this long. And yeah. for those in Ghana for wasting your, um, how do you call it, your bundle or what do you call it, um, internet, um, whatever. Okay. Um, and I'm glad that you, you came.